you uh, for your time today with the committee. I ran a four-hour session on Saturday, on a sunny Saturday uh, last week in Bray, on the, the, these issues and had some of the uh, very useful documentation from the Insolvency Service. Um, and there's huge interest in this. Uh, we, we know that the banks, talking to the, the, the people who are still trying to negotiate, even now, uh, on behalf of borrowers, I'm hearing the same thing from them all, which is the banks are still not doing any deals. So I imagine everyone is waiting on this legislation and, and the service to go live. Can I ask you, can a borrower avail of the insolvency route if they are not in arrears on their mortgage? They can avail of it if they're insolvent. Uh, now, that th it could be theoretically possible that they are up to date on one of their loans, but in the overall uh, context, insolvent. But the test would be, are they solvent or insolvent? And on that test, um, one has to make a judgment call as to what is a reasonable percentage of household income to pay against the debts, right? So we could look, two people could look at the same case. One person could say, these people are able to, to meet their debt repayments, therefore they are solvent. Somebody else could say, they're not. They're paying 40% of their net income. That is, a, that is an unsustainable portion. And therefore, on the basis that they need money to live a dignified life, they are insolvent. Um, is it the case, for example, that if a person looks at their net household income, looks at their finances and says, you know, we're paying, we are, we are not in arrears. We have, we have struggled and we have struggled too much to stay out of arrears. We're paying more than a third. Third is the UK guideline. We're paying more than a third of our household income to service the mortgage. Therefore, as far as we're concerned, we are technically insolvent. Uh, would you agree with that and would you say that the people in those situations could therefore avail of the insolvency process? I, I think if, if somebody is already um, meeting their obligations, albeit because they have cut their cloth uh, to some extent almost too tightly uh, to meet their current situation, it, it sounds to me like there is the, the, the capacity or the potential to do a deal short of any insolvency process. Um, but to go back to, to your specific question, I think the way in which one would assess the reasonableness of their outgoings, uh, it would be with reference to the guide that we have produced on reasonable standard of living and reasonable living expenses. Uh, that would be your, your, your first stage in, in that process. Okay, so if I as a borrower take a look at the reasonable standard of living as produced by the insolvency service and I say, I, I have been servicing my debts, but actually were I to leave myself and my family this amount of money, I could no longer do so, you would be satisfied that they would be insolvent and therefore could, in, could, could initiate an insolvency Potentially process? Potentially insolvent, but as I said, it, it, it would appear to me on the, on the face of it, without looking at a specific case, that there is the potential there to actually do a deal short of any of these arrangements. Yep. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Can I ask, uh, we, you were talking about examples and examples used during training. Uh, the Insolvency Service produced a small set of case studies uh, some months ago, uh, and I was looking for a second round of case studies to be produced, specifically because, in my opinion, the case studies that were produced didn't reflect some of the detailed conversation that had been had as the insolvency bill went through the doll. Can you tell me, has that second set of examples been produced? There is actually a number of uh, examples that we are continuing to work on and we would hope to publish over the coming weeks. We did publish a further tranche uh, at the end of June, but they were primarily designed to show how amounts owed to the revenue commissioners uh, are treated in the context of any of these arrangements uh, and we are currently working on, on a number of others that we would hope to publish. And indeed, we will keep that under review to ensure that as we actually get real uh, cases uh, over the line that, that we ensure that the sample cases that we have on our website are reflective of, of, of what is actually happening on the ground. And can I ask um, when the second set of examples come through, one I'm very keen on, which I've mentioned to you before, is uh, Minister Shatter was very clear in a back and forth with me in the chamber uh, during the legislative process that six years was not a target for somebody in a PIA, it was a maximum. An example I used, uh, which is on the record, was for a lady in Wicklow Town, uh, and the minister agreed that there was no public benefit to a, to a six-year process, and that in that situation, a three-year process uh, would have been appropriate. Can I ask uh, that you would ensure that whatever examples are produced reflect the debate that was had in the Oireachtas, 
uh, because I think that one, for example, is very, very important. I'm not hearing people, when I hear people talk about the time, all I hear is six years. I'm not hearing people say up to six years, and the minister was very clear that it was up to six years. Can, can you ensure that that, that that is included, that that is reflected? Certainly, we'll, we'll, what we are trying to do is to ensure that the, the sample cases that we have on our website are as re representative pos as possible, obviously within the time constraints that we have. I would certainly agree that the kind of situation that, that you suggest there is one that could potentially um, uh, exist in the context of, of, of a, of a real-life case. We do already have one situation within our suite of, of sample scenarios that envisages uh, a PIA, I believe, if, if I'm not mistaken, finishing within three months, uh, simply because it's the disposal of an asset that is, in effect, what's been offered, so that that PIA isn't six years, it's actually only three months. But certainly the scenario you suggest there is, is certainly uh, a potential one that could be wrong. And, and just to be clear, the scenario in question uh, involved the write-down of the mortgage. So at the end of the three years, the lady in question was put back on a sustainable footing. So I, I, I'm aware of the one that you have. Um, most of the examples I've seen don't include write-downs, and those that do go out to the six years. I just, I just want to bring it to your attention that the minister was very clear that you can have a PIA which keeps a borrower in their house, which includes a substantial write-down of the mortgage to a sustainable level. And if there is no public good to be served by this person being in a process for six years, that there is no reason why they couldn't exit. Indeed, the minister suggested that it would be appropriate for that person to exit the process with the write-down intact after just three years. Thank you. Um, on bankruptcy, you're obviously now very, very aware of the, the, the system that we're about to uh, instigate here. Why would anybody, in your opinion, not continue to use the UK scheme where the total length of discharge is one year, there's potentially an extra two years of a payment order. That, that's contrary, uh, that's compared to three years of bankruptcy here and the potential for an additional five years. And my understanding of the UK system is that um, not only is it one year compared to, to three, but actually if you've been in arrears for six months, the magistrate will take that into account as part of the 12-month period, so that you could move to Belfast or Derry or London or Manchester. If you've been in arrears for six months, you could actually be back here discharged of all your debts in just six months. Can I ask, why would, why, this is not meant to be a leading question, I'm, I'm genuinely interested, why would people avail of the new bankruptcy regime here if they can, if they have the wherewithal to get themselves to Belfast or Derry for, for six to 12 months? I think you're right to suggest or, or to, to state that obviously anyone is free to choose whether or not they travel to the UK to, to avail of the bankruptcy regime there. I think that the first point I would make is that from a financial perspective, they should be no better or worse off. Uh, a bankruptcy trustee in the UK should act pretty much in the exact same way as the official assignee here. You lose all of your assets, you lose all of your, your income streams other, other than that which was required for, for reasonable living expenses. Uh, equally, in terms of the UK, the kind of protections that might exist here with regard to your principal private residence or your, your pensions may not or, uh, extend over to the UK. So, that, so, so that's certainly a factor to take into account. Equally, uh, to avail of the one-year term of bankruptcy in the UK, you need to establish that your COMI, your centre of main interest, is in the UK, and that will take a number of months. So you're, in, and in all likelihood, that is a, a, a period of around six months for you to be able to establish your COMI. So the one year is now actually 18 months when you take that into account. So you're then comparing the 18 months compared to the three years um, to see whether or not one is more attractive than the other. And for those that have a family, have a home here, or have other ties to Ireland, I believe the, the, the differential there is actually quite small, particularly when you realise that the financial outcome is the same, uh, whether it's in the UK or, or here in Ireland. And indeed, there, there's been a number of high-profile cases in the UK where those that apply to be declared bankrupt there and are judged 
not to be cooperating with the trustee, that one year um, exit from bankruptcy is postponed un until that cooperation is deemed to, to have taken place. So I think they're the kind of factors that, that, that would be at play when, when somebody is comparing the, the, the different options. Thank you very much. Uh, two minutes left, Chair. Thank you. I, I, I'll try and get the two questions in and we'll see how we go. Uh, one of the questions that came up repeatedly at the session in Bray over the weekend was the question of joint ownership. So we the example, several examples of women remaining in the houses, the husbands had gone, the husbands were not contributing to the mortgage, therefore they were in arrears. Another one was parents had co-signed, uh, the children had left the country, they'd emigrated, they, they, they were abroad, they, they weren't um, uh, contributing and therefore the mortgages were in arrears. So we've got these utterly tragic situations where parents who've paid off their houses, might be in their mid-60s, mid-70s, um, are in danger of losing their homes. Can I ask for a, P, for a, a PIA to, to work here, um, be it a husband and wife or partners where one of them is not cooperating with the, 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 the mortgage, um, the person who's left behind, can they instigate the process themselves or can the person who's also not paying the mortgage essentially veto the other partner getting into a PIA because they're not willing to, contribute, to, to participate in it? No, I think in, in the case of somebody who has a mortgage in, in joint names, they can apply in their own right uh, to seek relief under one of these ar arrangements. And if they succeed, then they are free from their obligations with regard to that mortgage. The person who wasn't party to that application is still liable uh, for, the, for, for what they signed up to with regard to that mortgage. Or where, uh, let's say, those parties remain to get together, they can apply on a joint basis if, the, if all of their debts are joint and therefore get the relief uh, together. So, that, so there is that option. So where somebody perhaps is left, there isn't um, uh, an obstacle to the person who remains in, in availing of the relief. Thank you very much. Have I time for one no. quick one, Chair? No? <laughs> okay. I'll bring, you, I'll bring you back in the Thank moment. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Okay, I, I want to slip down to about here.